Hello and welcome back to episode two of our History Talks. I'm joined today again by Toby McLean, history there. historian, and Pete Blinsky, owner of Entoyment here in Paul. Hi there. All right, I hope you enjoyed our last video that we did. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll leave a link at the end of the video, which you can clap, click on to, and uh, it's the Bavarian Army during the Napoleonic Wars. Today's talk is going to be about the French infantry tactics, again, during the Napoleonic Wars, and hopefully this will link into early part of next year with Toby doing his history talks here in Toyman in Paul. Uh, more on that later on in this video. So Toby, infantry tactics of the Napoleonic period for the French. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating subject, and, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to literally just going to touch on the subject to inspire you for further <laughs> reading and research, and we'll include a list of uh, various books that you might look at. But we're essentially looking at the period from the Revolution in 1789, the outbreak of war in 1792, right the way through to the final downfall of Napoleon, famously, at Waterloo in 1815. Now, that's a 22-year stretch. The French army underwent several major changes in that time. It fought nearly every other nation in Europe. Uh, it was successful for the large part, uh, but it was defeated a number of times. What we need to think about is what did the French military find at the beginning of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic War and um, how did they adapt to the circumstances that they found? Now, number one thing to say is that this is an era of mass conscription. So unless you had a particularly good reason or you were fabulously wealthy, um, you had no choice but to serve in the French army and the largest number of recruits were actually uh, taken straight into the infantry. So. At the outbreak of war in 1792, you had two major forces operating inside France. You had the old Royal Army, uh, the army from Louis XVI, uh, and then you had the various revolutionary armies that were kicking around France at that time, um, hastily raised conscript units and volunteer units with varying appreciations of tactics. The big revolution comes in 1793, when under increasing pressure on all frontiers, the Royal Army is combined with the revolutionary armies to become the, the, the army of the French Republic. And this is the instrument with which Napoleon forged his empire. Uh, it's the instrument that he took with him to Italy, two fabulous campaigns in Italy where he routed everything in front of him and it's the instrument which he refined and honed into the victors at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, the Battle of Jena and Auerstadt, or the two battles at Jena Auerstadt and the Battle of Eylau and Friedland and so on right the way through to 1815. But it wasn't a static institution. It was an institution that was in a constant process of being reformed, revised. Tactics were being refined in various ways. And so to say, well, the French army looked like that throughout the Napoleonic Wars is a bit of a misnomer. It looked different at different times. Typical example, uh, after the disaster in Russia, the whole army was reconstituted. And so the army of 1813 would be uh, a mere shadow of what the army had been in 1805 and 1806. So you, if, in a sense, you have a number of successive different French armies according to the date uh, and the, the raw material, the, the conscripts um, themselves. So we really have to pin down the date when, when we're thinking about the French army. What date are we dealing with? What's the composition? <clears throat> what we're concerned with here primarily is the infantry. Uh, and so, so the, the infantry started off as a bit of a mixed bag. So you had um, an infantry from the old Royal Army, well-trained, not especially enthusiastic, and the revolutionary armies full of enthusiasm, um, full of spit and vinegar, but actually um, not trained at all. So the creation of the amalgam, the, the junction of the two armies, two groups of armies, in 1793 created this weapon so for the for the first time you had numbers um, in 1793 the French could put just over one million 
men in, into arms. Um, but you had the new adoption of revolutionary, truly revolutionary training. And the training was all based on the drill book of 1791, the French infantry drill book of 1791, product of um, the post French Revolution army. Although remember France was still a kingdom until yeah. they chopped the king's head off in, in nine, February 93, <laughs> when it became the Republic, of course. Um, so you had this drill book of 1791, which had been the product of a century of debate and discussion in the French army. And the debate and discussion was column versus line. Should we try to fight in deep columns or should we try to fight in extended line? And both sides had their um, proponents. Now what they did was they had a series of, of large scale exercises before the revolution and both sides claimed victory. They said, oh well, you know, obviously the column's gonna be the best or the line's gonna be the best. The drill book of 1791, which stayed in the French army till 1830, <laughs> it was that good, um, actually combined the best features of uh, both um, deep order and extended order. So you would have that the, the situation that the French armies, the infantry, um, would maneuver in columns. Uh, and there would be columns of divisions. So two companies wide, three ranks of two companies in the later part of the period. Um, and then those um, columns of divisions would then maneuver to the position where the regimental commander decided that they were in the right place to deliver their fire. They would open out into their line and then deliver their musketry and hopefully shatter the enemy's morale and then advance. So you had a mixture of column and line formation in the French regulations laid down before the war even started, followed by all French units right the way through to 18th. And is that, is that where the term Lord of Mix comes from? So yeah, in French it's Lord de Mixte, which is a mixture of columns mm -hmm. and lines. So it was a way of getting the benefits of musketry volleys um, uh, and the impetus or the speed of manoeuvre of the columns. In general though, the regimental commanders would try to engage the opposition in lines if they possibly could. Um, but often that wasn't possible for various reasons. <laughs> and therefore you might have a mixture of lines and columns engaging the opposition. Um, so that's laid down. That's how it, the, the troops are supposed to operate. And they go into the war in 1792 with that drill book in their pockets. Of course, the, the, the level of training in 1793 is a bit patchy. You have some reg ex-regulars, but you have some recent recruits. And so what you find then is the commanders um, break down their companies into skirmishes. And so these groups of skirmishes will go forward in groups um, and engage the enemy line prior to the, the main body of troops coming up behind. This is completely different from what every other European army did. The Austrians didn't believe in skirmishes, um, which is strange for the Austrians because they fought on uh, border campaigns against the Turks and whatnot. But um, they tended to try to make all their skirmish skirmishes, their Grenzers, um, fight in close order. They thought the close order was the only way to fight and they didn't believe that skirmishes would work. Later on, they learned the hard way that you do need some skirmishes. Um, but it was sheer lack of training that the French initially used great numbers of skirmishes. Um, and as training got better, they, they actually reverted back to what the drill book of 1791 actually said. So yes, skirmishes would be used, but only in certain circumstances. So despite the fact you have light regiments they would operate in, in usually in close order. And how much can Napoleon take personal credit for those changes, or is he just not involved at that point? He wasn't involved. He's in so. campaign not in Austria, isn't he? So in 1791, Napoleon was an obscure lieutenant junior officer in the artillery. So he got nothing to do with the writing of the 1791 drill no, book. No. That's really the work of a guy called the Comte de Guibert, who should get all the kudos for writing that drill book. Um, 
So Napoleon finds a ready-made system in 1796 when he's appointed to command the army of Italy. Uh, and that's a political appointment. It's not because he's a great general, because he isn't. At that point, he's a, he's a nobody. But he has done two things. He's um, kicked the British out of Toulon. Uh, and he's dispersed the mob in Paris with the famous whip of grape shot. So he's politically flavour of the month. So they send him to command the army of Italy, a secondary front, and that's where he makes his name and his reputation as, you know, the great um, leader of French arms. But there were lots of other famous generals at that time. But Napoleon picked up the infantry system that he found left to him by the French Revolutionary Armies, the Armies of the Republic. And there were various changes made during his time, but they were more administrative. Um, for instance, I'll give you one change that Napoleon made. He found that he was running out of infantrymen. <coughs> so the standard formation in line was three deep line. And so Napoleon says, well, we haven't got enough infantry to have a three deep line. Let's have a two deep line. And then 500 men can deliver the same volley as 750 men. So it was a mere economy drive to move from three deep to two deep line. And that was about um, 1809 when, when they, they, or even slightly earlier, maybe 1808, when they reduced their line from three deep to two so deep. So do you say that he's fortunate in, in that, his time, timing? Yeah, very, are very. And those doctrines? They were already in place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he he did not make any um, when he arrived in command of the army of Italy. He didn't make any major changes to French infantry doctrine. Um, he used what he found there, and he had some great infantry commanders uh, on hand, like Massena and people like that, who were subordinate to him. So he took advantage of the <coughs> the the um, superlative maneuverability of the French infantry, which was far superior to his Austrian opponents. Um, okay, their training and equipment wasn't quite up to scratch, but they, the, the, the drill book of 1791 gave them superb maneuverability, which allowed him to do all the, uh, the fancy footwork that he did at Rivoli and Arcola and Lodi and places like that. Um, and of course, the, the, the morale aspect, he, he never neglected. So we've brought some, these are primarily Warlord, Vic, the Artillery's Victrix, and there's some Perry figures mixed in. Yeah. And they is a Perry, Perry yeah. command base. Um, <laughs> so in 20, for 28 mil, we're representing these fairly, fairly realistically to what, how they would have formed up. Um, yeah, so what you've got there is a group of, I guess 36 figures yep. uh, formed in three ranks deep. So uh, from the beginning, your formation is too deep. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've got to imagine that line of three, three deep st stretching probably about four or five feet in width, in, in line formation, because the battalion would contain 900 to 1,000 yeah. men, and you've got about 36 there. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to multiply the size of that. Um, so it, it, the formation that you, you, you're um, showing with your with your miniatures there is is a, a, a deep uh, formation, far deeper than it would in line. It would have been very long and thin, um, and of course it wouldn't move around the terrain in in that line formation. It would form its column of divisions, so two companies wide. Um, in the later empire, it would be. Six companies, so three ranks of two companies. So in a war games table, we do this, don't we? Yeah. I put the standard bear at the back, but you get the idea. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so we tend to do this in a war game, don't yeah. we? We're playing black powder or something like that. Yeah. In fact, it would be much, much wider, wider because it's three, three ranks of two companies, each three deep. Later on, they, they, they dropped the third rank if they didn't have enough troops. Um, so already the shape of your, I'm guessing that's your battalion, the shape of your battalion's a bit, a bit wonky because you yeah. made some compromises with figure scale and ground scale, sheerly for, uh, for convenience. 
Um, and does that scale down better in 15 mil or, or smaller, 12 mil? Or well, I guess um, in the very small scales, six mil and so forth, it, it would look, you could use more models and it would look more proportionate. But there's always, always, always going to be a compromise between the historical number of uh, men in, an, in a battalion, for example, and the footprint of that formation on your tabletop. Um, now, the nature of that compromise is for the individual gamer to decide. But just, just be aware that 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 is not the shape of a battalion uh, in in whatever grand scale you're using. Um, yeah. So you, you, you inevitably, to make your game playable, you're going to have to make some um, adjustments, some compromises um, and some abstractions. Otherwise, you, you, you know, you're just playing sort of one to one, which is, um, which is obviously impractical. Um, for yeah, any sort of game. 100%. Mm. And, 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 and the same with Rangers. Well, yeah, so uh, in theory, um, the Charleville 1777 musket could fire into the next room in that scale. It uh, wouldn't hit much. But so, and I think in, in a lot of games, you, what, you say, well, the range of the, the smoothball musket is 36 inches. Yeah. Well, that might. <laughs> that might work as a, a kind of effective range, if you like. Um, but you're also compressing the, the ground scale and the ranges. Um, now, infantry units engaged at different ranges depending on, on the circumstances, but most commanders would would wait to about 70 yards before, before they would deliver a volley. Um, and in the 1791 drill book, the French fired by platoons. And you're going to say, what's this platoon thing? Well, to make matters confusing, the company was an administrative formation for the issue of rations and ammunition and so forth. The tactical um, subdivision in the battalion was the platoon. And so each platoon would fire and advance, fire and advance. So you'd have kind of this rolling, advancing fire if, if it was an attacking scenario. Um, they could then um, break down to individual fire if that's what the commanding officer wanted. But in lots of rules, we just say, well, unit A fires at unit B, but we never ask the question, well, what method of fire are they using? Are they firing by platoons? Are they firing uh, individual fire? Are they firing ranked fire? Uh, and of course, the role of the third rank in in, in the 1791 drill book was to load the muskets and pass them forward. Um, and so, you know, are, are you simulating that effect? Of course, the British rejected all of that and they said, no, we'll, we'll go down to our two deep line, which had been developed in the American War of Independence, and then we can bring all our muskets to bear on the enemy and each man loads and fires his own weapon. Is that the case in the French? Is that the only reason they do that, or is it also down to numbers? Good question. I think um, they they had a lot of unpleasant experiences in the American War of Independence, and and it kind of caused a total rethink of battle tactics. And they figured that accuracy of shooting, as far as it was possible with a smoothbore, was far more important um, than rate of fire. So it gave them more accurate shots. Remember too that when the British line faces the, the French column, the, the, the Brits on either end of the line are, are pretty much out of effective range. Yeah. <laughs> so what they would do is then they curve their line to, to, fo to fire in on the opposing formation. Um, and so um, they frequently then the, 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 the British could bring overwhelming firepower to bear before the French formation could shake out into its battle line, ready or its, uh, its line ready to give its fire. So um, a lot of wargamers run away with the idea that the purpose of the column is just to barrel through yeah. mm. the opposition, yeah. um, like some kind of human battering ram. Well, that's obviously not going to work. They would they would approach to effective range, shake out into their line, and then try and. You're not going to column into that, are you? No. No, no. Ain't gonna go well, is it? No, no, no. So, the um, in the early days of the revolution, sometimes uh, when the opportunity prevented itself, masses of untrained troops would just launch themselves 
in, in a mob at the enemy, but that failed as often as it worked. Um, and so you know, there was no sense in which a French column would try to, through, through the mass of a crowd, try to barge its elbow its way through the opposition. They would always try to use musketry if they could. The problem was that where the opposition was hidden, as it was so many times, <laughs> in uh, Wellington's campaigns in Spain and Portugal, that they didn't exactly know where they should open up their formation. Of course, consequently, they were caught on the hop, trying to manoeuvre into the right position. The volleys would come in and the formation would break up. Uh, and then um, they would be vulnerable to a swift um, bayonet charge. Now, uh, the French and their opponents really did not... The bayonet was more of a moral threat, really, than, uh, than an actual weapon to be used in combat. It was just the threat of the cold steel that would force the opposition to scatter and run for safety. So this idea that there were extended bayonet duels um, is a complete misnomer. It, it didn't, didn't really happen like I've that. I've seen Sean Bean in a few of those. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Talking of TV representations, uh, one of the things that the Russian filmmaker Sergei Bondarchuk, who made Waterloo, but before he made Waterloo, he made the, the epic Russian version of War and Peace, he actually used, as he did in the Waterloo movie, he used the Red Army. And you can get some idea of the mass formations manoeuvring in um, the shots that he took of his his. Napoleonic formations to recreate them for that. For that it's movie. quite hard yeah. to get that. Can you pick it up on yeah. YouTube? YouTube that? Too, yeah. yeah, yeah. You often get little clips of it. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it was ex it was extraordinary because he in the Soviet Union he had an unlimited budget and as many extras <laughs> as he as he could gather from from the Red Army. So he had um, particular advantages. Um, but if you wanted to get the impression of what manoeuvring would look like on mass then that's the closest and, that, and those get. columns must be pretty i mean in, on mass they're pretty intimidating aren't they mm. it depends who you are uh, i mean this is the, this again is a mythology of the revolutionary war um 50 of the time the, the opposition would skid out or they would they would get out there um but not surely because of the weight of the column advancing towards them, it would be that their tactical position was compromised. But 50% of the time, they stood their ground and blew it to bits. So this, I'm talking about the Revolutionary War now. So it was highly risky to launch um, an assaulting column without delivering musketry first. And um, sure enough, after the 1790s, then that, that idea was abandoned. So they would not... There were manoeuvring columns, certainly, but they were, certainly would not launch a column or a, a assault with cold steel. That was, that, was, that was for the birds, really. That was kind of desperate times during the revolution. Um, but as the soldiers were better trained, then they would, they would use their personal weapons, their muskets, as much as they could un under control of their officers. But it, <coughs> I guess it's more dramatic, isn't it? It suits the revolutionary yeah, propaganda. Yeah. yeah. You know, a great big gang of us chased, <laughs> chased the enemy off. Um, and we have this stereotype of the, the Austrians and their allies being somehow this fossilised military organisation. But remember, even, even the Prussians were trying to reorganise their armies in 1806. They hadn't quite finished by the time of the Battle of Jena. But, you know, they, they would get, get into a more flexible formation. And eventually all European armies, apart from the British, who kept their old system, all the European armies then adopted the more flexible formations that, that the French had introduced with their 1791. It's, it certainly does get shot to bits, but it's very inspiring when you watch Waterloo. Yeah. And the French go forward in the, with the fanfare, and I find myself becoming French for about 15 minutes. Yeah. And then, you can imagine uh, seeing that coming over the yeah. road, so okay, you think, oh no, <laughs> that's a lot think, coming. <laughs> I think that's more a testament to the skill of the filmmaker <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. than it is to the, the effectiveness of that, of that battle tactic. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. imagine the damage that artillery would do mm -hmm. to that kind of yeah. formation. It would um, it, just be horrendous. Now, as the war went on and on and on, um, the, 
the level of training required to manoeuvre and then deploy in front of the enemy fell away. So what we get then by 1809 at the Battle of Wagram is Marshal MacDonald advances his entire corps in a giant column uh, to, to achieve what you've described, to achieve this, this um, what Napoleon called the master rupture, the breakthrough force. It's a shock and awe type thing. It is. Um, and of course, MacDonald's corps got absolutely smashed by the Austrian artillery. But that's more of a reflection of the level of training and the, and the quality of the recruits than it is of any doctrine. So MacDonald just decided on the, on the spur of the moment that he would advance his, his corps to try to break the um, Austrian line at Vagram in, in this unusual formation. So that does become slightly more common as the wars go on. And of course, we have another famous example of the Austrian Brigade Mass, which is designed to achieve the same effect. Um, but I think it's more to, to create an imposing spectacle than any, any tactical usefulness, because obviously in that dense formation, you can't, you can't use your musket. And the musket is the, the dangerous bit of an infantry formation, isn't it? So, it? so in both of your opinions, how well is that that represented on tabletop? I think, yeah, systems. I was going to say, I, I think, um, you know, I've played quite a lot of wars over the years, but I think, I think today's war game is more about putting the game on a table as opposed to what we're talking mm. about here. It's tactics. It's yeah. tactics and mm. that, and, and the levels of command. Yeah. You know, is what you, you alluded yeah. to right at the start. Um, I don't know about yourself, but that's just how I feel. Just certainly listening to what you were mm. saying about the French column there, you know, it, its representation. Perhaps we're doing away with time scale, ground scales, we're keeping a rough figure scale now, but it, it's loose yeah. on most sets of rules. I don't know. I mean, that's just the sort of things I've picked up over the years. Well, we're, we're subject to the tyranny of the prettily painted miniature, aren't we? Everyone loves miniatures. I'm the I'm same. I, I think miniatures are fantastic. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, are miniatures the best tool to represent Napoleonic warfare? Probably not, but they, they sure look nice. Mm. <clears throat> now, this is the question that... Um, in, in time, the share price just dropped. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. still, they're, they're still great to paint, I mean, and they look great. But mm -hmm. this is the question that um, Paddy Griffith addresses in his classic Napoleonic Wargaming for fun. It says, well, first of all, decide what level you're going to play at. Are you going to be the the junior officer in a skirmish game, like, uh, I guess, sharp practice or shackers and bayonets, which give you a fantastic sort of low-level representation of Napoleonic infantry warfare? Or are you going to be a regimental commander? Or are you going to be a, a corps commander or a division commander? Or are you going to be the army commander? And in Griffith's book... He gives you a set of rules for each one of those levels of game, which are each trying to represent something completely different. The problem is, and we've all um, played them, is the things um, like uh, the old Newbury fast mm. play, where you're endlessly going through um, sheets of factors and, and you get a, a number at the end and then each figure is 33 and then you count up and you take one off for every 30 completely pointless exercise <laughs> yeah. and really no more realistic than than a game of sharp practice so um i think before we rush out and and, and spend our, our life savings on miniatures we should decide what level of game we're going to play so um and in some games just don't need miniatures and those skirmish games feel like they're more movie no, reality. Yeah, through they? no fault of the of the mass battle games and your black powders yeah. and general to army and stuff. They're just trying to do the best of what they can do with a very difficult situation, aren't they? Exactly. But then yeah. don't don't you feel then in, in quite a lot of sets of rules that are out there, the higher level games and skirmish games, yeah. that they don't really represent the skirmishes so much. So it's like you said, it's the the, the rules themselves sometimes get a bit confused. They do. Is what level they're they're representing? No, you're absolutely you know. right. So, so you're taking the role of you know a, a captain deciding whether your company of the ninety fifth will go into skirmish order or not. 
to be honest, who cares? Mm. You know, it, it really, the, the army commander doesn't care. Or, or you're deciding whether to form square or column or line or whatever it is. Those those details should be left to the junior officers. Um, yeah, the, the higher command, so it's division command and upwards, should be making much more important decisions like uh, how do I achieve my objective? How do I control this vital strategic road? How do I... Um, you know, break through the enemy centre. Those, those, those are the kind of army level decisions. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be making the the, the the battalion commander level decisions or the regimental commanders decisions for him. And I think that's where the old style rules, the new brief ass plays and, and so on, fell between two stools. Yeah. They wanted to do all the fiddly detail, but they also wanted to place you on on the army general's horse and making all those big decisions. It's just too much for the player to do mm. in, in, in a in game format. Plus you get it finished in one evening. So you had the the old style of war game, the grand manor style of war gaming, where these games would go on for days because you were individually moving skirmish companies out of battalions and um, deciding whether to form a square. I, I massively glaze over with games like that. Yeah. I, I, I want to play my toys like anybody else, but I don't want to do that. No, you don't want to go through it. <laughs> no. Endless factors, you know. No. The colonel's wig has been slightly moved to minus one. <laughs> yeah, from around. yeah it's, it's good. There, there was a, it was popular in the day, wasn't it? Because it was, it, it, it was, um, it was a kind of fashion, I guess, in wargaming. Nowadays, the fashion is drifting the other way, so that we're we're kind of reducing everything to the most basic levels. Um, and it's, you know, chuck a cube and decide what happens. I can't help feeling that there is a happy medium between that level of intricate detail uh, and the actual, you know, the, the, the dice rolling school of wargaming. Um, but I, I think if if people are interested, you have a look at Paddy Griffith's book, The Polynet Wargaming for Fun, which is available as an e-book. You can get it as a PDF quite cheaply. And it's just chock full of good ideas. It even gives you several rule sets in the book, which you can then go away and adapt to your heart's content. But it gives you the division game, the regimental game, the skirmish game, and the army How game. How old was it? Oof, 1986, okay. seven, when it came out. I was reading yesterday in fact. I, I knew Paddy Griffith quite well. And um, he, he was often controversial, but he was always, always interesting. Um, and what he had to say was always worth it's much like you, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm honoured to uh, to take on that mantle because he was a, he was a great figure and a good friend. Because it's, I think, I've played say Black Powder. I played it in 28 mil, and I've played it down as far as six mil. Mm. Mm. Now, now the problem is, and there be many many people out there the same as me. Is I obviously get very excited about playing twenty eight mil and collecting twenty eight mil, and, and, nice, and they're readily yeah, available. Sure. Yeah. But I can tell you that for definite, that powder felt better than six mil. It felt to me like it was doing. A yeah, better, it was doing a better job of. Well, you, you've fallen into the trap, haven't you? You've let let the figures drive the game, yeah. rather than the game drive the drive the 100%. figures. Yeah. I think yeah. that because of, because these would be better for your for your skills because this is so readily available. Yeah, it's fun to collect, and yeah. and it's. Uh, you know, it, was like, it was like at the last video when you was you were talking about the size of the Bavarian yeah. cores and things like that, yeah. and we were just sat there thinking, "Leave that one out, order play that one." <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so be careful in that sense. Don't let the figures drive the game. Let the game drive the figures. It's too late. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was it nine crates you got? <laughs> yeah, yeah, twenty crates. Twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, heresy upon heresy. Sometimes you don't even need figures. Yeah. You know, so so you know there are good games to be had that just don't use figures. They might use maps. Um, they might just use written messages. They might be like a diplomacy game. You know, it's, it depends. Think about the game and then think about what's the best means of representing what so you're doing. It's almost like a matrix type, type yeah. style game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's certainly possible. And the great thing is about the Napoleonic period is it gives you enough inspiration for all kinds of levels of games. Mm. Because even, heaven forbid, fantasy games are now uh, branching out into the Napoleonic period with the publication of Silver Bayonet, mm. which is you know hugely 
popular according to sales figures. Anyway. I love the figures. Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah. So they've they've thought of their game first, don't they? And then the figures have followed on. Yeah. It's kind of the right way around, even though the, the subject is kind of a bit outlandish, but it's, it's fun. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Um, so this is what this is what we try and do in the history hour here is that it's a group of um, war gamers mostly meet together. We talk we talk through the history of a period, but we're not talking through the history of a period to pass an exam, no. like an A level or a degree level exam. We're talking through the history of a period to find out what is interesting about that period. First of all, why why bother with it? Secondly, um, what sort of features can be built in to your to your games, and then. Um, Giving suggestions on rules that w might work or um, figure ranges that might be suitable. So it's really looking at the history I was looking at um, history from the point of view of the gamer. What does the gamer need to know? What uh, and pointing them in the direction of further reading and research. And it's um, it's quite unlike. I mean, you've you've attended many. It's quite unlike. A lecture that you uh, might go to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I did history A level. Yeah, it's, completely it's not like that. that. Yeah, exactly. like that. yeah. So it, it's more to to give you, if you like, a survival kit. So you could you'll t you'll teach yourself far more um, than you can learn in in a couple of hours during um, a session here. But it's giving you the basic tools, and then you can go away, research to your heart's content, and then. It does give you that added value to, to whatever game you play in that you you know something about what you're trying to represent. Now, you might not be perfect, but on the other hand, you can make that imaginative leap from what you're doing on the tabletop to to the exploits of your, your favourite and I, general. And I feel there's nothing wrong with admitting that you collect armies and you, you're not sure what to do with them. I said to Lee yeah. that mm -hmm. I felt that it's a learning um, curve. Yeah, it? I felt that I, I might as well play 40k or Age of Sigma, but I want to play historical. Yeah. And the reason I want to play historical is because I want it to be... Nice to uniforms. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I want it to be a, 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 a relatively accurate representation. I'm not, I'm not concerned about the result. Yeah. So I want to be an accurate representation of a period, and I enjoy painting the figures and collecting the figures. And there obviously are a lot, in, and I think they're less so now, but in Wargaming there were a lot of self-taught geniuses. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. common so, disease. Yeah, and so, <laughs> and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there that want to know, this is my collection, but I want to push my collection around the table, and, it, and I want it to be... As close so. as is reasonable. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think, I think the difference with, just picking up on your point there, Peter, the difference is with playing historical war games is... You want the representation. You don't, as you said, you don't have to dot the eyes across the T. Know the level you want to play at. Yeah. But the most, I, for me personally, with the American Civil War, visiting some of those battlefields, putting myself in mm. that commander's position of issuing those orders to those men, and mm. then coming back and thinking, ah, my table don't represent that. No, right? exactly. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I can see ah, too much. Uh, yeah. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? So it, to me, that yeah. is important. So still having, and I suppose that's the difference with fantasy and sci-fi. You were never going to get that, but with historical if you've got a chance to go and visit the battlefields yeah, absolutely. having a look around getting a perspective of the commanders and the, yeah. and, the, and the troops' perspective that certainly does help and helps and you, you'd be shocked by what you can't see yeah mm. not by what you can see exactly yeah. i have no idea what's going on behind that wood could be anything <laughs> could be the entire imperial guard or um just a cantinier with a barrel of brandy <laughs> but there you go but there we have it then guys i mean Thank you much, Toby. That was Pleasure. a brilliant, brilliant intro into the French infantry tactics from the revolutionary period through to obviously the end of uh, 1815. Once again, thanks to you, Pete, for letting us film this and no getting together doing this, mate. I love it. Yeah. And we we'll certainly look forward to doing some more. And as Toby's alluded to and did briefly at the end there, they do uh, in here at Toyment Pete does and Toby puts on a history hour every Sunday evening. Now, obviously, with COVID happening at the moment, we don't know what changes may happen in the meantime so keep an eye out on the website and i'll put a link in the description below for the facebook page for pete 
for enjoyment here. And then there's the events and everything that's going on. And Toby's always posting up there with the History Hour, what's going on. I think currently at the moment you're doing India. We're in India, yes, yes. We've just finished off the Marathas in India. <laughs> so, um, we're going on to the dessert now, which will be the Sikhs. <laughs> so there we are, some interesting sort of insights and chats and that. As we say, with these uh, episodes that we're doing, my little history talks, we're hoping to sort of combine those with the History Hour as well. So give everyone who doesn't have a chance to go in down to enjoyment a chance to actually sort of get, get involved and get a flavour of what's going on. And if you have got a chance to come in down, what time on Sundays is it? Pete? Six thirty start, um, and, and you've also got the Warlord um, Napoleonics coming out next month as well. So I was, was just about to say as well. The non so, yeah, this, this, yeah. so actually next month, uh, sorry, just talking then. The history hour is going to be moving more into the, uh, the tactics of the Napoleonic period, and what better way with the, obviously with the epic Warlords games as epic Napoleonics release get started in something like that, or even <laughs> lovely yeah, 28 mils like that. And that's, and that's another scale. Yeah. <laughs> we should revisit it now. So there we are, guys. I say apologies if you heard any noise in the background. The gaming centre is still open. Obviously, guys are in there enjoying their games and that in this sort of Christmas period. And uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully yeah, they've enjoyed themselves anyway. But, anyway. but there we have it. Hope you enjoy yourselves. Have a, have a wonderful Christmas. And on behalf of all of us, Merry Christmas. Stay safe and happy wargaming. Thank you. Cheers.